Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History's Lunch Program. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. And we're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube, where those videos are available to watch anytime afterwards. And if you've not already done so, please silence your phone. We'll have another edition of our History Happy Hour from 5 to 7 tomorrow evening, featuring music by the Epic Funk Brass Band, local food trucks, food from Nick Wallace Cafe, and a cash bar. Guests can also join interactive flash tours throughout the museums to learn about the history of music in Mississippi. It'll be a fun one. That's free out in the Hall of History tomorrow evening. And then I hope you'll come back next week for History's Lunch when we'll screen the new documentary, Steve Holland, Jesus Was a Democrat. <laughs> then be joined by Steve Holland, Marshall Ramsey, and filmmaker Rex Jones. It'll be boring, I'm sure. Today, I am delighted to welcome back Trent Brown to talk about his book, Murder in Macomb, The Tina Andrews Case. Trent Brown is professor of American studies at the Missouri University of Science and Technology. He grew up in Macomb and Brookhaven and earned his undergraduate degree from the University of Mississippi, his MA in English from the University of Virginia, his MA in history from the University of Iowa, and his PhD in history from the University of Chicago. Brown is the author of six books, including Roadhouse Justice, Hattie Lee Barnes, and the Killing of a White Man in 1950s Mississippi. He did a terrific History is Lunch about that book last year. He edits the series Civil Rights in Mississippi for the University Press of Mississippi. Help me welcome Trent Brown. Uh, thanks to Chris and the Mississippi Department of Archives and History for organizing History as Lunch. I very much appreciate the invitation to speak with you all today. As I said last summer, standing here at this podium, I come home every chance I get, and Mississippi is my home, no matter how long since I've actually lived here. And so today I want to tell you about another Mississippi story. Um, here are the facts in brief. In August of 1969, the body of Tina Andrews, a 12-year-old girl, was discovered in a clearing in the woods in an oil field outside Macomb, Mississippi. Partially clothed, she had been shot in the head. For months, local law enforcement authorities, which included the Macomb Police, the Pike County Sheriff's Department, the Mississippi Bureau of Investigation, and the FBI, investigated the matter. They interviewed a number of suspects, but while there were many leads and many rumors, there were no arrests. Over a year and a half later, however, a witness came forward with information about what had happened to Andrews. Significantly, she went directly to the district attorney and not to the police, whom she said she feared. She said that two men had picked up Andrews and her and a third girl, whose name she consistently said she never knew, outside a teenager's club and took them to the oil field, apparently with sexual designs on the girls. And by girls, I should specify that I mean children who are 12 and 13 years of age. This is a shot of downtown Macomb. This is the corner to which the three girls walked and where they were picked up by two men. This is a good chance to thank my good friend Carol Case among his many talents. He's a good photographer and I am not. And so some of the photographs that you'll see in this PowerPoint, thanks Carol. Right. The district attorney subsequently secured indictments against two Macomb police officers. One of them was tried and ultimately acquitted. Charges against the other one were dropped. In the two trials, the defendant consistently maintained that he had nothing to do with the murder of Andrews. The state was unable to persuade two juries that he had. No one was ever convicted of the crime. Right, so, 
more specifics. The body of Tina Marie Andrews had been found on August 23rd, 1969, having lain there in this oil field for something like 10 days. Some of us will remember that in August of 1969, Hurricane Camille struck the Gulf Coast. Macomb was far enough north not to receive significant damage, but it did get a good bit of wind, heavy rain, and then the usual August heat. So fast forward to March 1971, a year and a half later. Two Macomb police officers, Richard McIntosh, to whose photo I'll return in a moment, and Ted Fleming, were indicted by a Pike County grand jury. The person who went, this is Tina Andrews, a photo of the 12 year old. The person who went to District Attorney Joe Pigott would become the state's main witness. She was Billy Joe Lambert, a friend of Tina Andrews, and more to the point, one of the last people to see Andrews alive and in the company of McIntosh and Fleming. According to Lambert, she and Andrews rode with the two men to that oil field where Andrews' body was eventually found. She testified that the girls had a good sense of what might happen to them on the ride out to the oil field, so when the car stopped, the two of them got out, one from each side. Both attempted to run, Lambert got away, Andrews did not. Lambert testified that McIntosh grabbed Andrews she directed an obscenity at him, and he punched her in the face. Lambert walked and ran three miles back to her home in East Macomb. When she was asked later by the district attorney and by the defense attorneys at trial why she didn't go to the police if she had seen something terrible like this happen, she said succinctly that she did not trust them. McIntosh had not been a member of the police department in 1969. He was in the police auxiliary, but Fleming had been in 1969 um, a sergeant and a veteran on the force. Following their indictment, the two men were suspended. At their March 1971 arraignment, both pled innocent. McIntosh's first trial began on October 29, 1971. Testimony began before a jury of 11 men and one woman. Newspaper reports described the jury as biracial. Black jurors were a relatively new thing in Pike County in 1971. McIntosh was 25 years old at the time. This is an earlier photograph making him look more schoolboyish than he would have looked in 1969 or 1971. McIntosh would be tried first while Ted Fleming, 35 years old, by 1971 a police lieutenant, was to be tried later. Now the jury in the 1971 trial, or the 1971 trial was handled by District Attorney Joe Pigott. Um, the, in that trial the jury heard contradictory evidence on a variety of basic matters. Whether McIntosh could be placed at the scene of the murder on that August night in 1969, whether McIntosh otherwise knew Andrews or the state's main witness, Billy Joe Lambert, the basic credibility of Lambert was severely attacked, and even the identity of the body found in the oil field was a point of contention. The argument about the identity of, of the body is understandable as a uh, basic matter of legal defense. If the body in the field were not that of Andrews, then the case against McIntosh and Ted Fleming would lack a fundamental basis. A Jackson pathologist served as an uh, expert witness for the defense in the case. He testified that the body discovered in the oil field on August 23rd could not have been that of a person who was alive on August 13th because of the, heavily, uh, the heavy deterioration of the remains. That pathologist, however, had never examined the body or even seen the body 
his uh, testimony was based on uh, examining a photograph of the, um, of the crime scene. The state, of course, introduced witnesses to support their contention that the body in the field was that of Tina Andrews, with one testifying beyond any reasonable doubt, she said, that the teeth, skull, and photograph of Andrews that she had examined were all of the same person. Now, one reason for the argument about the condition of the remains, uh, and this is not pleasant to imagine, is that whoever left Andrew's body in the oil field turned a discarded couch over it. This, this spot of woods in the oil field was well known to um, local young people as a make-out spot, and it was also known as a place where one could dump trash. And so whoever left her body in the oil field turned a couch over it, and it acted, in effect, almost like an oven in accelerating in that heat the deterioration of the remains. Now, both state experts, both state expert witnesses, um, noted the poor condition of the teeth in the remains. There were no dental records. It struck one of the doctors as highly unusual that a person with teeth so poor had not received dental treatment. Now, that's an opinion that speaks more of his expertise with the handling of, of the, the pain of decaying teeth than it says about his knowledge of families with limited means. Now, Macomb, the context in which the killing and the trials occurred, Macomb had a well-earned reputation as one of the most violent cities in a state that was perhaps as resistant as any other to the civil rights movement. Now, all the basic institutions of the town, the courts, the law enforcement authorities especially, had been shaped by decades of Jim Crow. The president of the local chamber of commerce later recalled, the way of life we had lived through the years was crumbling around us, and I am sure I did not like that. Now, the violence that met the civil rights movement in Macomb in the mid-60s was a reaction by many local whites, mainly but not exclusively working class, uh, not only against black aspirations for social change, but also, I think, against white Macomb's authority, white Macomb authorities' failure, as they saw it, to control the black population. If you don't do it, we are going to take it into our own hands was the attitude of some of the men who took to dynamite in the summer of 1964. Now, Macomb's influential citizens did not like night riding or bombings and the kind of uh, violence that frightened investment. They resented the Klan and the bad publicity that terrorism had brought to the area, as much as many of them shared the basic aim of the Klan in keeping certain things the way that they had been. Some Pike County residents were Klansmen. Most others, including the great majority of downtown businessmen and the jurors that heard the case in the two trials in 1971 and 1972, were not Klansmen. Now, to the national media, one white Macomb person might have seemed much like another, but not so in the eyes of local people. Some white Macomb residents were as worried about other whites as they were about black people. Insistence on order and control in Macomb then could operate across social class lines as well as racial lines. Now some things had definitely changed in Macomb by 1969, by 1971, by 1972. Four or five years in Mississippi in that period did bring revolutionary changes in the law. Changes in fundamental beliefs are harder to measure, but surely they moved more slowly. In evidence, I would offer the many 1970s lawsuits one can find over voting, over school desegregation, and even over conditions at the state penitentiary at Parchman. Now, black jurors served at both trials, 1971 and 1972, for instance, but there was a good deal of continuity 
formal and informal in Macomb as well. The police department and the sheriff's department employed men who had served during those years when one of the basic tasks of those departments was to keep civil rights protesters under control. Downtown bankers and merchants and other men of influence held the same positions that they had held for years. People with power and authority in Macomb recognized how close the city had come to anarchy in the mid-1960s, and that's a word I don't use lightly. By the early 1970s, however, many white people in the area not only wanted to put those years behind them, but also to do what they could, like many other Americans, to serve the interests of law and order, as they viewed it. Black Macomb residents had mounted a powerful challenge to the old order in the 1960s, but many white residents were determined by the early 70s to reestablish control, and if this meant supporting local institutions such as the police department against claims of justice for a socially marginal girl, then so be it. This was the context in which Andrew's murder was investigated and her accused killer was tried. Now, the case was not swept under the rug, far from it. The two district attorneys who handled the two trials in 1971 and 1972 did a fine job given the evidence that they could produce. But facts and attitudes about race and social class in Macomb made it too difficult for the state to win a conviction. Now, back to Tina Andrews. She came from a modest social background. When I began working on this book, more than one person said, why in heaven's name, if your daughter didn't come home at night, would you not immediately call the police? My answer was some variant of some people believe that the police can and should be called and held to account and answers demanded from them. Other people have had experiences with the police that make you hesitant to reach out to them. There were police officers in Macomb who had earned a reputation not to be trusted. Now, the same thing held true for the state's main witness. Why, she was asked, she was asked um, <coughs> by District Attorney Joe Pigott in 1971, why didn't you come to me sooner? Her answer was that when she had made it home that night from the oil field, she waited a day or two, told her mother, her mother said the best thing for you to do is just keep your mouth shut. It's too dangerous to go pointing fingers at police officers in this town. Now, The men arrested, as we have noted, were Macomb police officers in 1971. They were represented, or I should say he, Richard McIntosh, the only one of the two who ever stood trial, was represented by a very effective attorney. B.D. Statham had a reputation in southwestern Mississippi as the man you would want to call if you were in big trouble. His services did not come cheap. He was aggressive. He was a bulldog. He was what you would want in an adversarial system of justice. All right. B.D. Statham framed the case in the two trials in 1971 and 1972 as one of reputable versus disreputable people. The Wayne witness had not come forward until a year and a half after the event. Why do you trust her when she's had this long to concoct a story, he asked the jury. When she testified in 1971, she was 15 years old. She had a six-week-old baby. Press coverage and statum in the courtroom consistently referred to the state's main witness as an unwed mother, an unwed mother, okay? So that was what the jury heard. Do you believe this disreputable girl or do you believe this fine looking young police officer? Do you support law and order or not? 
In other basic ways, the two district attorneys who prosecuted the case were not dealt a very strong hand of cards. In 1971, Joe Pigott who had been an attorney in Macomb for 20 years. He had been the district attorney for about 10 years. He had been the attorney for the school board in the mid-1960s, a low or no pay position. Um, and Pigott was a, was, a, was a fine attorney, an experienced attorney, but he was limited by what the evidence, um, he was limited by the evidence. In 1971, he had decided not to run for reelection as district attorney, not anticipating a mistrial in the Andrews case. The man who ran in 1971 and who replaced him was a man named Jim Kitchens. Um, some of you know Mr. Kitchens, Justice Kitchens, currently sits on the Mississippi Supreme Court. Um, district attorneys in Pike County and other places in Mississippi into the early 1970s, it was not a full-time position. One ran one's private law office, kept the uh, county's uh, records there, and people stayed in private practice uh, while serving as district attorney. Jim Kitchens was the first that I can find, certainly in the southwestern Mississippi era, or area, who campaigned on a promise to be a full-time district attorney. His, uh, his campaign advertisements say, no man can serve two masters. And so he promised and was uh, a full-time district attorney. Now, um, their hands were tied in, in significant ways. There's no physical evidence tying anyone to the crime. There are no blood stains in an automobile, no hair or fibers tying the defendant to the victim. This is way before DNA. Um, the best that could be done in this era was, uh, was blood typing. Okay? As I've said, there were no dental records, even to so establishing the identity of uh, the, the remains was a, took a significant amount of time before the jury. In both trials, the defense showed that the state had no witness to Tina Andrews' murder. The most the state could offer was Lambert's account of what had happened apparently on the evening of Andrews' death. Lambert testified, Lambert testified that Richard McIntosh struck Tina Andrews on the face. When her remains were found, her jaw was broken. Now, um, several years ago, Justice Kitchens was good enough to sit with me for an afternoon and talk about his work on the case. He is among the people who believe that when Tina Andrews' jaw was broken in the oil field, that that was the fateful moment. That had the men um, took sexual advantage of the two girls in the oil field, they could have dropped them back in Macomb and it would have been their word against that of the children. But once her jaw was broken and they realized her jaw was broken, that is, as Justice Kitchens put it to me, when things went south. They decided that that was a complication that couldn't be explained away and that she needed to be silenced. Area people, those on the jury and those who were not, were essentially asked to consider, do you think the Macomb Police Department employs child murderers, or do you think that a girl like Tina Andrews came, who came from a modest background, simply met her death at the hands of unknown parties? In the eyes of some people in the community, Andrews ultimately seemed not to matter very much. That's a strong statement but it's borne out by things that people told me in the last four, five, six years as I was working on the book. A juror told me that the defense introduced things about the girls' habits, including skipping school, drinking beer, staying out late, even staying all out all night. The juror, who was in his 90s when we had the conversation, said, you know, the things that the defense told us didn't make those girls sound too good. One can still hear. I reached out to a Macomb person of longtime acquaintance. I said, what do, what do you remember about the Andrews murder? 
She said she came from kind of a trashy background. Okay. Um, the stories about the Andrews murder that have continued to circulate in Macomb over the past few decades speak not only to Andrews' social origins as a factor in the case, but also to those of the men alleged to be responsible directly or indirectly for her killing. A good deal of rumor from the 1960s to the present has attached to the case. A person told me a few years ago, some of the best men in town were in on it. People are skill, still scared to talk about it because of who they were. Now, it's a rare small town in the South that doesn't draw suggestions of corruption uh, among a cabal of well-placed people. But I'm skeptical in this case. The exercise of power in Macomb did not necessarily involve conspiracy. Matters of import could be handled above board and confidently by people who had power. The families of Tina Andrews and the family of Billy Joe Lambert, the state's main witness, were not among those people. Now, Tina Andrews was not murdered, I think, by a conspiracy of the respectable. One can be told, one can read on Facebook in comments about the case, Tina knew something about important people in town and she was silenced for it. I mean, that's a fascinating story, but I don't see anything that bears that out. Now, prominent people in town did have a stake in the outcome of the trial. Macomb Police Department had been a rough organization in the 1960s. Many Americans, for those of you who remember 1968 elections, 1972 elections, law and order was something that not just deep southerners talked about, but all Americans heard via the media. <coughs> there was race as well. A black juror explained to me that white jurors were not pleased by the changes that his presence represented. To be more frank, the black juror told me that as when he took his seat in the box, one of the white jurors turned to him and said, the only appropriate place, and I'm paraphrasing, the only appropriate place for a black man in this courthouse is as a defendant. So, an attorney's who practiced in the era have told me that judges pushed for extremely quick resolutions of trials, even of murder trials, because of their hesitancy to sequester a biracial jury, as the Macomb paper called it. And a black juror from the, one of the, the, the second trial of Richard McIntosh uh, told me more things things that say a lot about privilege and race in the era. The jury was sequestered. They were sequestered at the Holiday Inn, if any of you know Macomb, right there off of I-55. A Holiday Inn where the black jurors could not have stayed when the Holiday Inn was built. Okay? But they were sequestered there um, through the several couple of days of the, uh, of the, of the trial. Um, one evening, one of the jurors told me, he noticed the sheriff roll up in his marked, in his sheriff's department vehicle, wearing his uniform, and he went up to the hotel, pulled out one of the jurors, a prominent downtown businessman, um, and sat in the car, talked with him. He did this again the next evening. And the juror asked the deputy, who was there at the hotel, who said, I thought you were kind of here to keep things like that from happening. And the deputy told him to, um, shut his GD mouth and mind his own business. So um, I asked later, a few years ago, a, m a member of the Macomb legal community if he knew that a juror had been pulled out and questioned or instructed or whatever happened in that sheriff's car. Um, this attorney said, no. And I said, improper? And the attorney was, a very, was an elderly man, very soft-spoken, but he kind of bucked up and said, improper, illegal. <laughs> but certain white men in Macomb had a decided stake 
in maintaining Macomb's reputation and that of the police. Now, upon the dismissal of the cases, in 1972, McIntosh was acquitted in the second trial. The case against Fleming was dropped. I asked Justice Kitchen why he made the decision to drop the case against Ted Fleming. He said, we thought we had a stronger case against McIntosh, and I felt like we just, we, if we couldn't, if we hadn't been able to get a conviction in two trials of McIntosh, we weren't going to have a luck, any luck with Fleming. And he also said, I hated to have to put that girl, meaning Billy Joe Lambert, I hated to have to put that girl through all of this again. Now, upon the dismissal of the cases, the system was done with both McIntosh and Fleming in more ways than one. Um, they were given all of the money that had, they'd been suspended without pay. They, had, they were given all of the money that had accumulated in their police retirement funds and were asked to resign from the department. Both men did, and they received no compensation other than a half year's salary as a parting gift. Um, Fleming went into the air conditioning business and refrigeration business in Macomb, where he lived until his death in August of 2004. And he was 70 years old. Richard McIntosh left Macomb. He began working in the construction business. He married, he raised children, and he now enjoys grandchildren and retirement in southwestern Mississippi. He has attended his Macomb High School reunions and retains some ties with friends and classmates from the era. And in case anyone is listening, these matters are all public record that can be documented. Now, when Tina Andrews was murdered, I was four years old. Um, not surprisingly, then, I have no memory of hearing anyone discuss the matter. However, on Delaware Avenue in Macomb, my grandmother operated a beauty shop where I spent a lot of time as I grew up you know, uh, with my grandparents. Um, I'm certain, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall because I'm sure that the case in a Macomb beauty shop would have been a matter of intense speculation. Now, members of my family, as it turns out, um, attended the trials, served on the jury, one of my great uncles was the foreman of the jury in the second trial, and I have a copy of his handwritten, we find the defendant not guilty, right? And some of my relatives even went to school with some of the principal figures in the case. But all that was news to me when I began writing this book. Living in Macomb in the late 1960s and early 1970s, I knew very little at all about the city's recent history. Um, our history classes, even our Mississippi history class, didn't seem to get that far. We ran out of semester before we got to this period. So I learned about the case, the Andrews case, only a few years ago. Um, I wrote something in 2016, I think, about Macomb that drew some comments, and one day I opened Facebook and there was a message what do you know about the Tina Andrews case? And I said, I don't know anything at all. And so that was the genesis of the book. But I did wonder how the murder of a child in my hometown could go unresolved. As I began writing the story, I think I see more clearly how this case and Macomb's broader history are shaped not only by matters of race, but also ones of social class as well. The Tina Andrews case demonstrates, I think, how considerations of power and respectability formed lives in the community then and later. Thanks to the work of many historians, we know a lot about the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s, particularly at the local level. But the Deep South in the years after the civil rights movement into the 1970s and 80s is relatively unexplored territory. Southern communities were shaped and continue to be shaped by practices and institutions formed over a half century ago and longer. So many of the issues that the Deep South currently wrestles with, politics, elections, economic development, public education, 
crime, incarceration, are informed, let us say, by the history of the recent past. What the Tina Andrews story shows, I think, is the continuing significance of social class in the Deep South, as well as the profound influence of gendered ideas of behavior and respectability. Those issues are ones, I think, that merit a lot more explanation and in exploration by historians. But in those cases, as in this one, we're dealing not with broad social forces, but individual lives. Here, one of a child who was untimely taken. When I go to Macomb, I always go to Hollywood Cemetery. My father is buried there. Four of my grandparents are buried there. People that I remember from church and home in Macomb in the 60s and 70s are buried there. And so is Tina Marie Andrews, who never got a chance to see what her life would become. Thank you, guys. And I'll be glad to take any questions that you might have. I promise. There it goes. I have two, but they're connected. Sure. The first is what happened to the young woman who got away. Yes. And the second is what what, why, did, why were she and, the, and Tina in the car with the man whom she identified? What um, was her reason for their being in, in the car? To give them a ride home. Yeah. Um, was the explanation offered. There were three girls in the car. One, they dropped off on Delaware Avenue. And the other two girls, spe specifically Tina, lived about a block beyond where the first girl was dropped off. And according to Lambert's later testimony, Andrews was like, well, this is, you, let, me, let me out here, let me out here. And they said, well, we, we need to get some gas. And so they drove on out Delaware a little more. Wait a minute, turn around, take us home. No, no, we're, we're gonna go out to the woods. And both men seemed, she said, pleased or tickled by the fact that they were taking the girls out to the oil field and one of them allegedly said to Lambert and Andrews, later y'all can tell people about this if you want to. Okay, so what happened to Billy Joe Lambert? You'll notice that I did not have a photograph of her in the PowerPoint. Um, no photo of her ran in 1969, wouldn't have because she had not come forward then. No photo of her ran in 1971 or 1972 during the trials. Um, when I began <coughs> working on the book, course I wanted to talk to her. Um, I um, drove into Amit County where she currently lives and um, sitting outside her house you know I texted my wife and said well you know here I am I'm not sure if I should go do this and she said you went all the way down there you better get out and go knock on that door. <laughs> um, so I did and her husband answered the door. I explained who I was and what I was doing and told him that I wanted her to know, if, if I, I wanted the chance to tell her to her face that I was gonna do this book rather than have her find out about it in other ways. I gave him my card and said, uh, and she was there, you know, I could see. I said, do you think that she will talk to me? And he said, I don't think she will. And I said, I understand, but please give her this, and if she ever changes her mind, I would like to talk to her. And he, 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 was, he was much more polite to me than I would have been to a person in similar circumstances. As he turned to walk back in, I said, could you please tell her one thing? And he turned and looked. He said, what's that? And I said, tell her I believe her. Okay. Um, one can find photos of her on Facebook, but... Um, I, I feel keenly that I, expo in writing this book, exposed a part of her past that was painful, and I have no interest in um, causing any more pain to her by putting up a, a photo of her. There's not one in the book. There's not one uh, in this presentation. Okay. 
Thank you. Yes, sir. Very informative presentation. Thank you very much. Very much. Um, I was just wondering, um, the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Yes. Since this is a racial kind of situation we're talking about here, to what extent would the Voting Rights Act of 1965 have any kind of effect or impact on the, this case that we're talking about? Um, you know, because of course, more black people are going to be able to vote mm -hmm. after the 1965 Voting Rights Act. So I was wondering if it have any effect on the situation. In several ways, the history of the mid-1960s, I think, had an impact on this case. As some of you know, many of you know, in 1964, about 6% of black Mississippians were registered to vote. Um, an example of wait, be patient, change will come if we're allowed to oversee it ourselves, you know, kind of proves that that was not happening. The 1965 Voting, right, uh, Voting Rights Act did see a spike in voter registration in Macomb. Um, by the 19, change is slow. By the 1980s, um, black men were serving on um, Macomb City Council. There's been uh, a black mayor of Macomb for several terms now. So, you know, there were substantive changes that came out of changes in voting law. But the, the, the other thing that I, would, that I would point to is <coughs> the, you know, the, the violence in Macomb in 1964 was remarkable, even for, um, even when you compare it to other Mississippi places. There was what I think it's fair to call a campaign of domestic terrorism in Macomb in 1964 bombings night after night from the spring of 1964 into the fall. There was a campaign of terror by Klan members not directed against outside agitators. You know, in a place like Philadelphia, one could point to, here are these New Yorkers who have come down to try to change things. And if we get rid of them, we can stop change. The campaign in Macomb was designed to intimidate the black population and the white population. We're not going to allow change. The bombings came with remarkable frequency, but nobody knew what was going to be bombed next. You know. um, in the summer of 1964, um, a white family against, or about whom I wrote a few years ago, one of the little neighbor children asked the family, when's your house gonna be bombed? You know, this was the texture of life in Macomb in 1964. Like I said, the people who ran businesses, the people who operated the city government in Macomb in 1964 were, were flabbergasted by the bombings. They wanted the violence to stop. I mean, insurance companies were threatening to cancel policies on things written. Good luck persuading a factory from Illinois or Indiana to locate in a place with this kind of violence. You know, keeping the black population non-voting and under control was one thing, but a out of control bombing campaign to do that was another. And Joe Pigott, and this is uh, worth mentioning. <clears throat> in the early part of 1964, the state legislature passed um, law, conspiracy law, or conspiracy statute, aimed at controlling civil rights protests. And it was a tool. You know, if we can't get them on some charge or another, conspiracy. Pigott, district attorney in Macomb in 1964, looked at the statute and said, we, not, we may not be able to put the dynamite into the hands of a specific Klansman, but we darn sure can show that there is a conspiracy. And so he used that statute that had been passed by the legislature 
designed to be used against civil rights workers, Pigott turned it against the Klan. And they subsequently arrested, um, 11 men were arrested, FBI uh, involvement and interrogation of the men, and um, the bombing stopped, proof that there was a conspiracy. Do you know if there were uh, others who tried to intimidate uh, the young lady, is it Tina? Um, rather, other than just referring to her as an unwed mother at the trial. Oh, oh the, the state, the main witness, Billy Joe Lambert. The main, Billy Joe. Yes. It, was she intimidated at all by any of the outsiders? Oh, yes. Other than um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I stepped on your question. <laughs> what we already heard. Yes. Um, the night that she got home, she was sure that she heard somebody outside her window and had one of the men in the house go out to look. And there was either a step ladder or something that had been moved. So it wasn't probably completely a figment of her imagination. Before the trial, um, um, Richard McIntosh, this is a matter of public record included in the trial transcript. Richard McIntosh stopped by her house a time or two to see what she was up to. Um, probably, I think, trying to intimidate her into silence. I know you know, but here I am, and you'd better keep your mouth shut. He never said that. Lambert never said that he said that but it doesn't take too much imagination to wonder why a police officer, you know, in, in those circumstances would roll up on your house. The name of the pathologist yes. that made the assumption on the photograph? I think Bratley, maybe Forrest Bratley. Marie Nylon was the state uh, expert witness on the, the dental remains. They had to blow up a photo, you know, and, and a school photo, you know, to, to, and see her teeth and try to match them, you know, to the, to the skull. And that's what, uh, the, that's what the, I think it's Forrest Bradley. If, if, I'm, if I'm pulling this, uh, I'm trying to write too many things at once. Uh, Mr. Bradley, I apologize if I've got the, it's, it, 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 it's in the book, um, but that was the name of the pathologist, or that was, it was a Jackson pathologist. There, there just wasn't much evidence, you know. A year and a half later, you know, there's no murder weapon. Um, she was shot with a with a 38, but um, the, the woods, you know, thick with 38s in those days. I mean, that was not a not an unusual thing to carry, to dispose of. As a fellow Macomb native. Um I continue to see violence playing out in Macomb even to this day. And I was curious, to what extent do you feel that um, the corruption that you talk about in your book is also creating the issues that we see today? Yeah, um, I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm hesitant to use corruption in one sense in talking about the Andrews case in the sense that I do not believe that the police officers took the girls to the woods to silence them about things that they knew, okay? I think that the case looks, it, it, it looks filthy and that's what it is. You have two grown men who are taking two children, you know, to, to the woods for sexual purposes. I mean, that that's, uh, serves to me as an explanation, even if distasteful. Um, there were people in Macomb who had their reasons for wanting the police department either to look cleaner or be cleaner than it was. Um, some of those people you know, would speak overtly about these things. Others worked behind the scenes to try to clean things up, to get out problematic officers, to promote good officers. Is that conspiracy or is that 
simply trying to uh, use one's leverage to improve a system. Um, I'm, you know, as a Macomb, born in Macomb, grew up in Brookhaven, um, you know, the, um, um, you know, um, when I published the book, I received a number of, you know, messages and emails and, you know, the tenor of a lot of them is, um, why are you making Macomb look bad? And my response was something like, Macomb in 1964 doesn't take Trent Brown to make it look bad. <laughs> you know, um, you, you, you face facts and, um, you know, no one want, would want to live in, uh, to go back there. Um, but, you know, um, you know, to my Midwestern and Northern friends who say, what an awful place you write about. You know, I become defensive and say, hey, it's not uniquely bad. It's not, you know, worse than you can find corruption in small towns anywhere. So, you know, I will say again, uh, Joe Pigott and Jim Kitchens were absolutely not trying to sweep anything under the rug. They were trying as hard as they could to get a conviction. Um, you know, um, Justice Kitchens, to his great credit, when he talked with him, he said, you know, uh, if I were doing it again, um, I might have worked harder in preparing that witness for the kind of drubbing she was going to take on the stand, you know. Um, in the first trial, the defense wanted to introduce Tina Andrews' school records, I think as a way of showing that she was a kid of not a lot of worth. But Pigott um, stopped that from happening. So these are not relevant. Whether she's an A scholar or a, 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 a D student, she's a child who was killed, and that's the, the relevant thing here. Um, but to what degree, you know, I haven't lived in Macomb in a long time, you know. I'm going down there tomorrow, you know, um, and poking around, and that's my job, I guess. I see continuities between the past and the present. Um, I'm hopeful enough to believe that we have ways to, um, not to escape our history, but to address it and to move forward together better. We have a Chris, comment looks and a question from the live stream. Juana Harris says, this case highlights that class, status, and socioeconomic background also play a role in how persons are treated and how justice is carried out. Then Sarah Campbell asks, could you talk about what you believe about the importance of revisiting a crime story like this with the discomfort or pain of the humans involved? That's a, um, that is a great question, and uh, you know one I'm, I'm happy to talk about. Um, 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 I spent three hours yesterday afternoon with an attorney here in Jackson talking about a murder case with which he has some connection. And as I finished up with him, I said, I feel like a ghoul. I really feel bad, you know, about revisiting, you know, people's pain. Um, the, the case that I'm trying to write about now, when I, when I, and I did not do this as diligently with Tina Andrews as I did. I reached out uh, to surviving family members who chose not to, and as is their right, chose not to assist me. Um, in, in the book that I'm trying to finish now, I reached out to surviving siblings of the victim, and um, you know, I, I, made a, I made a very uncomfortable cold call to one of her siblings, and she asked me what I was afraid she would ask me and what I was sure I didn't have a great answer to. She said, why are you doing this? And um, three days later, I received an email from her saying, I've talked with my siblings, and we, we're not going to enjoy it, but we're going to help you. And um, I, I vividly remember telling um, my wife after that initial phone call, I said, well, time for a, a new book topic, because if, if they say, please don't do this, I don't know that I will. I'm keenly aware that, you know, I, I, my friends who write about things in the 18th or 19th centuries, they'll go, oh, this is a cool story. And, you know, um, 
the, the, the history that I'm exploring, dealing with people's living memories and pain, um, I try to be attentive to that. And um, the, um, certainly in the book that I'm writing now, there are things that I know that I'm not going to write because they don't seem necessary, write down because they don't seem necessary to the story. Chris, is there time for... Um, I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by, and, and I think you have persuaded me that the class distinctions within Macomb were just ingrained enough you didn't have to have any kinds of conspiracies yeah. either with respect to Tina mm -hmm. being silenced or with respect to uh, protecting the police department and I mean, it's very difficult to convict police officers of anything even today. They have law and order on their side and kind of diminish it from the prosecution. But based on the class distinctions, I don't know enough about Macomb history. Yeah. Was the Citizens Council operative there? And traditionally, the Citizens Council would be the bankers right. and insurance people. And Often, the Citizens Council was able to oh. both intimidate and control the black population yeah. and make the Klan take types only take action when the council felt it was appropriate. Do we have any notion of what those dynamics were in Macomb in the 50s and 60s? I can go back even further. Macomb was a railroad town, okay? Um, and that history was the, the the shops for the southern end of the Illinois line were um, located in Macomb. Great jobs, uh, big employer in in the area for, for for years, and Macomb kind of had a working class tenor to it that a lot of similarly sized southern towns did not. I mean, East Macomb, where um, Billy Joe Lambert lived. You know, was recognized by Macomb people. There's Macomb and there's East Macomb. You know, it's a railroad track division, but it's not a railroad track division based on race. It was a, it was, you know, this is the the, the rougher part, the working class part. Um, one of my relatives went to high school in Macomb um, in in the 50s, and um, his mother, uh, my grandmother, um, told me your uncle got along with everybody boys from East Macomb and everywhere else, you know. So, you know. so um, there had been a railroad, big railroad strike in about 1911 um, in which the, uh, the, the Macomb workers participated, but that kind of quickly disappeared you know, when the city celebrated its centennial. The railroad strike was not something that appeared on the, you know, in the, the official uh, city centennial stuff. Um, the Citizens Council was a little more active in, um, I, I think, in Brookhaven, just to the north, in part because one of the leading lights, you know, of the Citizens Council, uh, Judge Tom Brady, was a Brookhaven native. But I think that, you know, in the 60s, a lot of the, the working class elements in Macomb said, the, the city is not doing it, you know. The black people are causing trouble, and if they don't do something about it, we will. And they did. Just a, just a <coughs> comment. Um, so I'm a product of the Great Migration. Yes. And my parents left Mississippi. I was born in Chicago, but I've come back, of course, all of the time. And this is a cultural pattern. As a young youngster, we would walk the streets when we could, but my cousins would always tell me, our girl cousins, there's a certain time that you have to get off the street mm -hmm. because men, and I've, I've been you know, uh, privy to this, would cruise by yeah. constantly, not just the police department. Yeah. These are just um, men in cars, and they would, yeah. they would you know, advocate or try to get us, whatever. But our, their parents would always tell us when to be off 
and when to be home and what to do. Now, my cousins knew about this even more than I did, which is like the Emmett Till case. Yes. My cousins understood that I needed to come with them and we need to get home. Yes. Because this was a pattern, and it was it has been a pattern for years and years, and it was very dangerous the, the, for, the, for us to be out. I, I don't think I said, but I should say um, quickly that the car it, that the two men were driving that evening was not a police car. They were not in their uniforms. It was a, just a, a white car. And where they picked them up was outside a place called the Tiger's Den, which was a teenager's club. It was not a bar. It was a teenager's club. And so... Um, I wanted to use as the as the as the I wanted to quote at the beginning of this book uh, a 1960s song, but I couldn't get permission in time for it. And what I would have quoted was, "Hey there, little Red Riding Hood, you sure are looking good. You're everything a big bad wolf could want." And so this was a case, I think, of um, you know um, fishing where the fish were. Very quickly, this is so powerful. It gave me heartburn, a headache, and everything. I had to get some water, well, but powerful. And my two uh, questions are, have the Me Too movement ever contacted you about this? And secondly, do you think there will be some justice with McIntosh living with your book and people knowing more? Thank All right, um, in, in justice and in accuracy, Richard McIntosh was tried twice, he is acquitted. He was acquitted, and my understanding, um, attorneys in the room can uh, address this if I'm wrong, as I often am, that barring something really incredible coming forward, you know, the, his, his, he's protected against prosecution. Um, he has every right to live out his life, uh, as, if he's law-abiding, as much right as, as any of us do. Um, and was that the question about Macintosh kind of um, his reputation you know um, you know um, the um, various people as I was researching this thing said if you put my name in the book I'm going to sue you and um, um, I was worried you know and one of my attorney friends said Trent if you were a defendant in a murder trial um, we can construe that as, you know, public, you know, public information, you know, and you can write about that, you know, tell the truth, be accurate, but you can write about that. Um, the, um, you know, um, I attempted, um, another thing that my wife did was when I was down in Amit County, um, she said, now you've come all this way, aren't you going to try to see him? And I went to his house and knocked on his door, and no one answered. Um, and I said, you know, he has every right not to be harassed by me. And if um, he, um, you know, I wouldn't talk to me if I were in his position. And what I think I know about 1969 and 71 and 72, you know, is right there in the transcript and in the excellent reporting of Charles Dunnigan for the Macomb Enterprise Journal. The Me Too movement. Um, the, you know, um, the book that I'm working on now is about the 1986 murder of a woman. And one of the things that strikes me, and it, it, it took place in a college town, and I'm a college professor, you know, and now when tragedy hits a college campus, there's a very well-oiled, and I don't mean this cynically, but there's a very well-oiled apparatus that immediately rolls out. Here's the kinds of notifications that are pushed to students, in part because of the Cleary Act and mandates on reporting of crime on college campuses. But here's, uh, here's uh, support services. Here um, are counseling services that are available. Um, here's a candlelight vigil by um, a, a women's organization, if if the victim is a woman. Um, 1970s? No. 1980s, about which I'm writing now? No. You know. Um, but you know, Lambert, you know, was chewed up on that witness stand 
because she didn't fit the kind of image of respectability, you know, that the, I mean, the, the, the defense and the state knew this. She's got a six-month-old or six-week-old baby. She's 15. She drinks beer. She runs the streets, you know. Um, does that mean that she's not telling the truth? No, but it means that those were, you know, what, what her drinking beer had to do with what she could testify to in court seems to me, you know, beside the point. But it's the kind of thing that the defense relished telling the jury. She doesn't live up to the expectation. We have copies of <coughs> Goodman McComb for sale. Um, Trent has covered the case today, but there is a lot more in the book than, than we have time for here. Uh, Please come back tomorrow for the History Happy Hour, 5 to 7. Come back next week for the Steve Holland film with Steve, with Marshall Ramsey, and with Rex Jones. Today, help me thank Trent Brown for this fantastic program. Thank you.